Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Saturday edition of Collider Mailbag. This is a show where we take your viewer submitted questions. You email us at collidervideo at gmail.com, and we either answer them here on this weekend show or on our daily movie talk show. I'm joined by Wendy Lee over here. Hi, everybody. And for the first time, hey, well. John Roca. Thanks hey. for joining us. Hey, everybody. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm excited. Yeah, popping my cherry on the mailbag. So I'm. Oh. Red shirt guy. Oh, yes. Red, red shirt, shirt guy. <laughs> You're always known as red shirt guy, even when you so. don't wear a red shirt. Yeah, and then, yeah. no spoilers, but yesterday you took on Josh McCuga in the Schmodown. Yeah. It was, as you, if you've watched it already, you know it was a really tense fight. And uh, we went back and forth. Uh, but, you know, uh, no spoilers, but. It was way tougher than I thought it was going to be, but uh, in the end, you know, it came I, out the way it came out. Yeah, okay. I feel like I can't watch these these showdowns live anymore. I have anxiety. Yeah. I have anxiety. Try being in it. Oh. Well, yeah. No thanks. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right to feel that way. When I watch, even when I watch rewatch my the one against Scott, I was you know it's weird. You can put yourself outside of it and watch it. You're just like, answer it. You know it. Answer it. And best it's just, spin. Yeah, best spin. So it's just like you know, but it's fun to do, and I'm so happy I'm, I'm part of the of the people asked to do it. And this show is yeah. much more laid back yes. and casual. The opposite of Schmodown. There's no, <laughs> there's no right or wrong answers. <laughs> there's no pressure. There's no timer on yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. It's all good. All right, let's hear what the first question is. Wendy. All right, Craig Dalziel writes, Hey guys and gals, greeting from Canada, eh? With Tom Hiddleston in talks for Bond, I hope he gets it. He was great in The Night Manager. Do you think they will be replacing other characters like Q and M that were just introduced movies ago? I hope not because Ben Whishaw and Ray Fine are great. Bonus question, what is your favorite ending to a Bond film? Mine, Thunderball with the sky hook, which the Dark Knight used. Thanks for taking my question and have a great day. I have to admit, I'm not like a huge, huge Bond guy where I've seen a bunch of them. I mean, really more of the ones I've seen recently are like the Timothy Dalton, Pierce Brosnan, Daniel Craig one. So mm -hmm. I think total maybe like eight or nine of these Bond films. I don't have a huge selection to choose from. I'd probably just have to go with the, the ending of Skyfall, how beautifully shot it was. It was at nighttime with the fire and the smoke. Yeah. So as far as that question is concerned, that's my answer. In terms of Q and M, uh, I don't think so. I don't think they're gonna replace him. I think they're gonna keep Ray Fiennes and Ben Whishaw. I think it's much like the Batman situation. Not talking about the Dark Knight trilogy with Chris Nolan, but the, the, the Tim Burton one, you had Michael Keaton in the first two, mm -hmm. you had Val Kilmer in the third, you had George Clooney in the fourth, and you had, uh, I don't know exactly how to pronounce his name, but Michael Gao or Go? Oh, yeah. As Gough. Alfred? Yes, yes, yes. Gough. And he was Alfred all through uh -huh. those four series. So yeah. I feel like that's how Bond is. If they change whoever the Bond is, whether it's going to be Tom Hiddleston or Idris Elba or Henry Cavill or whoever, Michael Fassbender, whoever they choose, I think they're going to keep the other two uh, just to keep that continuity to make it feel like this is a continuation. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. It, it, the Bond has a history of keeping the people over into new Bonds and uh, keeping Q and M the same. I mean, uh, Judy Dench is a great example of that. She went through the Pierce Brosnan and into the Daniel Craig versions. And so, and to me, I think they purposely cast younger so that they could be on the mm. series longer. And Ben Winshaw is a fantastic choice for Q. He's, he's such a great departure from what you've had before which is the older bumbling guy which mm -hmm. we saw in the in the uh, in the Pierce Brosnan ones you see a, a, a kid who's more adept more intelligent a, a quiet more quiet kid and it works so well for what they did so yeah I, I don't see any way that they replace that and for me uh, my my favorite ending is one of the off Bond films, the one-off Bond films on Her Majesty's Secret Service, because for me it is always it is like my favorite Bond film. This side of Skyfall, Skyfall is pretty pretty much the most perfect Bond film ever made. But for me, this on Her, on Her Majesty's Secret Service with George Lazenby, the ending we see a James Bond getting married, finally wanting to settle down, <laughs> and Blofeld's female henchman in a drive-by kills his wife after the wedding right there right after they get married and that just gives you the idea that this is this is a tortured guy who will never find peace or happiness which is why he's the perfect secret agent because he can't be uh, convinced to settle down that sounds like instead of an ending it sounds like the beginning of a western yeah, right a true, revenge yeah. film western right. that's what happens and then they gotta yeah. go out there yeah. um I, you know this is a little deviating from the subject but related 
what did you guys both feel about Spectre? Because I was disappointed. I really liked Skyfall uh-huh. and mm-hmm. the latest Bond film. I just felt like both Daniel Craig and Sam Mendes didn't have their hearts in it, okay. and therefore that's kind of what we got. Uh, Wendy, what did you think of uh, Spectre? I haven't seen it yet. You didn't see Spectre. <laughs> I wasn't, I don't know. I just, you're not this, a Bond. That's this the best one, answer. This one, I just, it didn't call to me like all the other ones did, so I was like, oh, I think I'm just going to wait, and then I waited, now it's out of theaters, and then I'm like, I just watched it on DVD and Redbox, and I still haven't done it yet. Okay. Broca, okay. what you think? Uh, yeah, I saw it three times. Really? I, so you liked I, it a I lot. did like it, and I think the reason why I liked it, I'm, and I'm in the minority camp, and I accept that, I know that. A lot of people didn't like it like you, Dennis. Um, I just enjoyed the film because it was a throwback, which they didn't tell people they were doing. It was throwback to the old Bond films of the 70s and the 80s where he always got the girl, and he always made out, and he always like mm-hmm. had these situations. And so for me, it was nice to do a little throwback, have Daniel Craig kind of work within that system, still have echoes of what they're doing, a modern version version of Bond, but I thought the scenes were great, and I actually bought his romance with, uh, I f- uh, forget the actress's name. She's from um, the yeah, Blue, Blue is Valentine. The, Blue, no, oh, Blue, Blue is the, the warmest, warmest color. color. Right, um, right, French actress, but I, I bought it, and I like the idea that you brought back Mr. White there, that confrontation down in the, where he's playing the game and everything like that, and so to me, I enjoyed that more. I don't know if the Blofeld 100% worked. I like Christoph Waltz, so there could be arguments there, but I think it's an enjoyable film if you just sit back and just watch it. I didn't hate it. Yeah. I, and I did enjoy myself somewhat. I just d- disappointed with mm-hmm. it. I didn't feel compelled. I saw Skyfall probably three or four times mm-hmm. in the theater. I mean, it was one absolutely gorgeous to look at, and yes. two, I just I was invested into that storyline, and and this one just not so much. Yeah. All right. What's next? Kun Lee writes, "Hello from Myanmar. You guys, you guys and gals are awesome. I've been a fan of the show for two years." Why movies, especially action, fan- fantasy, sci-fi, are more expensive to make than ever if they rely too much on green screen? Is it that supposed to become cheaper? I mean, they rarely use practical effects these days. Thanks, and keep up the great work. I think it's because they're doing more and more nowadays in terms of, and more detail, too. Mm-hmm. Like, the visual effects nowadays are much more detailed, so that requires a lot more manpower and technology. You have to remember, back in the day, because it used to be, oh, green screen's cheaper, green screen's cheaper. In essence, that kind of was true back in the day, because what they used to do is kind of just, they would slap a green screen, and they would just either get a matte painting or some 2D thing, and they would just stick it behind you. Didn't really look realistic, (laughs) right? And that was the end of the day. Nowadays, if you ever watch any behind the scenes of some of your favorite big blockbuster movies, let's say like an Avengers you will see how much green screen is actually there and a lot of it you can't tell i mean look visual effects still is noticeable especially when it comes to human faces and and that stuff but when it comes to environments they have done such a good job now that a lot of times you can't tell the difference between a real building and a fake building so a lot Mm -hmm. of these buildings are getting destroyed you just think, oh, that's like a real building, but it's actually from green screen. Roca? Yeah, yeah. I think I think you just need to look at animation as the template. The fact that it takes four years to do an animated film gives you the idea of the level of technology that are constantly playing with. Uh, uh, earlier last year, I went to Pixar to cover Good Dinosaur, and they had to upgrade their systems to across the entire campus just to be able to work on the effects that they wanted to do for the Good Dinosaur. You could argue the results irrelevant. It's just that the amount of effort and time and and technology that they needed to create it so logically i think what you said dennis is correct the the specificity the detail is so extensive watch any behind the scenes on any of the transformers movies once again irrelevant of the results mm-hmm. the amount of work and effort and time and attention to detail requires a larger staff requires more technology requires more income you know just even if you go to the basics renting the studios renting the equipment if the equipment falls apart all that kind of jazz all that gets mixed in uh, to the costs of it and also people now are more astute as movie watchers so they are more willing to pick out the things that don't look correct like people gave uh, Civil War a lot of crap for a couple of scenes with Iron Man where uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s head you can tell the CG isn't great and he's kind of floating above his suit and it's the whole idea and that's even a film that great they will find the couple of things that don't work and announce it all over social media so the studios take more time spend more time and more money to get it more realistic I'm glad you brought up Good Dinosaur because that is an example I, I thought the movie was just okay yeah but 
when watching the film, outside of, of the actual characters, the dinosaur characters and the, the animals and creatures, the environments were real. I'm not talking like, <clears throat> like ooh, they, they look kind of real. They look like it was a live action film yep. and they, they happened to, you know, put in these, you know, cartoon characters yeah. in it. Like they yeah. went around and shot in this environment. Yeah. That's how good that, that looked. And it was great to see how much effort they took because they went on multiple trips and filmed multiple things, just themselves experiencing the environments. And then when you're watching it, because they showed us 25 minutes of the movie while we were there, I, I said, wait, no, that's actual, those are actual rocks. Those are actual, and they're like, no, that's all that's animated. Mm -hmm. And I lost my mind mm -hmm. because it was so perfect, like you're saying, Dennis, so incredibly believable, the environments that they put it in. Yeah. Wendy, did you watch Jungle Book? I saw Jungle Book. Yeah. Uh, what did you think about the, the visual effects and how good they looked? I couldn't believe that they did it all on a soundstage. I had to lean over. I was sitting next to John, and I was like, so this part isn't real with the trees and the leaves blowing in the wind? He's like, it's all CGI. I'm like, this can't be CGI. It looks way too real. Certain parts of the film, like you were saying, you can pick out little things because mm -hmm. the technology isn't quite there yet. Yeah. But it's astonishing what they can do now with just being able to be on the soundstage with one actor, puppets, and blue screen, green screen. And, yeah. uh, but it does take time, I think. I mean, you're you know, really into production, behind the scenes stuff. So it's like, how long does it to, for someone to like impose all of those things with the live actor? Right. Yeah, yeah, it takes a lot. I mean, it's just not just the visual effects, but then compositing and all that right. stuff. And we didn't even touch on uh, motion capture, which is stuff that Andy Serkis does, mm -hmm. and and you saw Benedict Cumberbatch do in the Lord of the in the Hobbit movies. Yeah. You, that also is technology. That's a lot of time and effort and money to get all that correct and, ex and uh, on point as well. Yeah. You guys miss the practical effects, though. Um, you know what? I think. It depends. It, it's all about what you use the practical effects for, because even something like Mad Max Fury Road, which I absolutely love, yeah. mm -hmm. has been touted for practical effects. They use so much digital effects in that yeah. thing. <laughs> like people, it's like, but they use the practical effects when they needed to. I think that's the choice when we're talking about, you know, I hate to always go back to this, but when they talked about the, the prequels, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How everything's green screen. So you, it wasn't that they use digital effects is when you don't use them in the pro don't use them for everything. Don't use them for like the table that yeah. the person's sitting on the chair that they're sitting on. You want to use it for things in the background or, or things that you can't do practically. And so that's what I thought Mad Max did so brilliantly was they knew what needed to be practical, what needed to be digital. Right. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great point. Force Awakens reinforces that because it's a good combination of both. You have the yeah. practical effects and JJ said he wanted to make an effort to make that more of what he wanted in his movie to evoke the original trilogy. Um, and I think he, I think Jason Bourne really saw, the Bourne movies really show you the, the practical effects, how that can be used really well. And it's that's one of those films that if you use CGI, I think a lot of people would have an issue with it because they enjoy the grittiness of those films. Yeah, especially like when you have car chase sequences mm -hmm. and you know suddenly they don't look so real when they're flipping over right. and knocking mm -hmm. each other. But, Something like Mad Max, like that. Those are real cars yeah. hitting each other yeah. and people jumping off of them and stuff like <laughs> crazy. That. Yeah. All right. What's next? Stuart Fletcher writes, "Howdy, Collider. I absolutely love your show and watch everything I can. I recently watched Jurassic Park and couldn't help but hold my breath during the T Rex scene in the ring. It's a completely perfect scene down to the effects, the lighting, the acting, and just everything. What do you guys think are perfect movie scenes? The 15-minute countdown, Aliens, and the lightning storm in Back to the Future are my runner-ups. You? Thank you." Roka, what do you got for perfect movie scenes? Let's, can we do more than one? Because yeah, yeah, as, yeah. I as, have two okay. or three. Have okay, two as three. an avid movie watcher, it would be very difficult for me to narrow it down to one. Uh, but I would say the ending of The Godfather mm -hmm. scene, the ending of The Godfather is one of the greatest scenes ever. Him handling all the business, like all of them dying at once. Spoiler, I guess, if you haven't seen it. But all of them dying at once. And then, uh, and then how he handles the entire business and the music, the acting, what's he's, what he's juxtaposing as a director as that stuff's going down is so fantastic. I think the scene between Bruce Willis and Ving Rhames in Pulp Fiction after he's killed everyone and they're standing there over uh, the hillbilly guy mm -hmm. that's been shot and they're having their conversation. That scene from the angle of the camera to the dialogue to the, move, the, to the uh, concerted movements together of putting down their weapons at the same time 
all of that fantastic scene and the scene in Alien I think where Ripley puts on the spacesuit you think she's out of it and then the alien shows up mm -hmm. and you're like you never feel more powerless and that film has already evoked such great tension and drama that when that scene happens and that moment happens you're just you're just like this the whole time uh, and then one last one I think I would include the last of the Mohicans near the end when they are running to save Alice's sister from uh, uh, Mogwai and the, the bad Native Americans in the movie uh, the way they shot the uh, the score the slow motion usage the reaction of the actors and the environment that they shot the cinematography just all all of it combines to make a very powerful, heartbreaking scene to watch in film. Wendy, do you have any perfect movie scenes? Uh, I was thinking about this, and this is more recent, but the first Avenger film, mm -hmm. when they were taking down that giant space worm. Oh, yeah. And it's just kind of, I basically envision like a comic strip coming to life and it's jumping from frame to frame, and I just really enjoyed watching that because for that scene, it really didn't miss, miss a beat, and I enjoy that till this day more than I enjoy the airport scene, even though that's awesome too. Mm. Okay, uh, for me, definitely one of my well, my favorite movie of all time, Goodfellas, entering the Copacabana scene oh, yeah. with Henry Hill and Karen. I mean, just the Steadicam shot that takes them in. It's basically perfect in the sense of this is he's taking her on the date and he's kind of sweeping her off her feet, and you there's all these twists and turns and it makes you as the viewer uh, in Karen's shoes and you feel like you're being swept off the feet. All the, you know, the power, the, the, the privilege, mm -hmm. the wealth that the, this guy has. And, and with the song, they have the crystals, then he kissed me. Yeah, It's just a perfect, perfect scene. And then it ends with them ending up at that table right in front. The <laughs> table didn't even exist. They put the table there just for him. Yeah. Another sequence is uh, the ending of Darren Aronofsky's The Wrestler. Oh, yeah. One of my favorite movies. Uh, the whole sequence of, uh, of how his character is, he's there, he's about to go out. Marissa Tomei's character comes in, basically says, like, I'm here. Like, you think this is a typical, like, romant romantic comedy. This is when the girl comes in and then saves the day and they fall in love and she's like no i'm here and, and and admits feelings for he goes out instead yeah to you know guns and roses sweet child of mine gets into the ring starts making a speech about about wrestling how much he loves it how much he loves the fans and during the match he's you know he's starting to have his like heart palpitations yeah. again you don't know if he's gonna live or die he doesn't care. He gets up on that top rope, you know, he flexes and he jumps and then yeah. he goes off screen and then that's the end of the movie. It's yeah. a perfect reflection of who his character is and what the movie is actually about. Because yeah. most people watch that movie and they think, you know, I you know, I want to see a happy ending or like I wanted to see him change and it's like that character it's it's not about change. Yeah, we're not all Norman Rockwell people. Yeah. Like some people are damaged from beginning for whatever reason, upbringing, whatever you want to ha say. And for him, I think that was a happy ending. He could have gone with Marissa Tomei, yeah. but he'd always wanted to get back in that ring. He's just built that way. So when the ending happens, it is his happy ending, which is dying in the ring. Yeah. Some people prefer to do that. You know, so Stallone has said that all the time about Rocky. That his original concept was Rocky to die in the ring in Rocky Five, and so they they some warriors. Just just need to go out that way and I still think it's a crime that he didn't win the Oscar no for me too he me too I, I love Sean Penn yeah, he was no great in milk Sean Penn. absolutely but that was it, it, and I think Sean Penn is overall a better actor sure. than Mickey Rourke sure but Mickey Rourke was born to play that role yeah it was it's yeah <laughs> All right. Uh, what's next? David M. writes, Greetings, Collider folk. With the announcement of Collider Nightmares from Clark Wolf and a few recent questions about horror, I have a question about horror movies for you guys. Everyone is scared of something different, but I think horror is generally lacking, lacking in purpose of late, especially in the mainstream. For example, if I jump out at you unexpectedly, you'll jump. If I intentionally gross you out, you'll be grossed out. Anyone can do those things. The reflexes that pass, not necessarily state of being. The first time I saw movies such as The Blair Witch Project, Audition, Martyrs, It Follows, and The Witch, I felt genuinely uncomfortable and unsettled for a few good months after. So my question is, why do you think horror movies are more about making people jump in or grossing them out rather than using fear and terror to craft a genuinely transformative experience at last? Thanks, and keep up the good work. Uh, I think it's because it's easier 
it's easier to do if you want to do those jump scares. And there's nothing wrong with jump scares. I just don't sure. think a movie should rely solely on those. Having a few good jump scares within a horror film, I think is totally fine. Same, the, the kind of the gore though, that's kind of why I'm not really into horror. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't like seeing a gore fest. I don't, I don't get any pleasure out of it. And I don't, I think it takes away. I, I want to see a movie that is more psychologically a, a thriller, that that sits with you he, he mentioned the witch that was a movie that i really enjoyed mm -hmm. my two favorite uh, horror movies are the shining and a movie called session nine. Oh my god and they're 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 just they're more psychological they make you they get yep. into your head it's less about you know freaking you out from from physical things but i mean i wouldn't blame like horror for doing that because every genre has their thing right like if it's comedy maybe it's gross out humor right mm -hmm. like poop and fart jokes right that's like <laughs> easy to go to for easy laughs for action, it's like let's just blow stuff up, right? Mm -hmm. Let's uh, visual effects and blow stuff up. So I think every genre has that kind of go-to thing, yeah. where if a director decides like, oh, okay, let's rely on these things. So I think that's what it is for horror. What do you think? Yeah, I think most people don't go to horror to have these incredible psychological explorations of themselves, mm -hmm. and you know, there's dramas that do that already. So I think most people go to horror films to get scared, laugh after the scare mm -hmm. with whoever they're with, and enjoy that time with them. Scare like. Uh, paranormal Activity was fun for me. I we went with the same ten people to the first three films wow. because we all just like and we would go to a midnight screening where, after it had been out a couple of weeks, so not a lot of people were there, so we could just enjoy it as if we're sitting all together in someone's living room watching this horror film. And it's so much fun to watch those kinds of things. So it's a communal experience. You enjoy getting that and these are studios studios are about making money and they know they got to appeal to in essence like the lowest common denominator of the genre which is the jump out stuff the gross out stuff like hostile all that kind of stuff yeah. uh and saw which mm -hmm. i can't just can't mm -hmm. get through any of those films because i'm with you dennis i don't like the gross out stuff and session nine what a great reference man yeah. that film is so underappreciated it's one of the best horror movies and it will mess you up if you watch it um and to me that's that's what i like like baba duke fantastic to me I enjoyed Babadook I like The Witch um, it follows I was on the fence about it I thought it was a good concept but it didn't quite 100% get there for me but I'm with you I like the horror that's a little more challenging and I'm with David I like the horror that's a little that asks more of you that goes deeper into the stuff but you have to respect that these are studios and they're pumping out these things uh, you know one after the other and obviously because we're doing a show on this network there is a uh, definite interest for it though that kind of horror you know? yeah I think uh, with Collider Nightmares they're going to cover the gamut of, yes. of the stuff you know the gore fest the jump scares and and some of the more psychological stuff I mean Absolutely. with Session 9 directed by Brad Anderson I agree it, it is an underrated film that a lot of people haven't seen yeah. I mean it freaks me out because those sequences with with uh, just those t the guy listening to the I forgot the actor's name. Yeah, Peter Mullen, the the no, lead, no, no, or no. David Caruso. Uh, uh, no, the other guy. Um, oh, okay. Uh, what's his name? Not Patrick Wilson. What's the other? J Josh Lucas is that? Oh his yeah, name? Josh Lucas. Yes. When he's listening to yeah. those tapes, and it's daytime. <sighs> And it's freaking me out. Like, he's sitting there. It's a daytime. He's listening to those tapes. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, my God. I'm so freaked <laughs> right. out. Wendy, what do you think about this? Do you think that, that you know, jump scares and too much gore is just an easy way out for horror films? I know you're a horror fan. Yeah, I like horror movies. Uh, I think jump scares and grossing out, it's not so much like an easy thing. I think in today's age it's now expected mm. i think people like you said they go and they expect to be scared mm. and they want to have that oh my god and then you laugh about it laugh like oh did you see kelly she like jumped out of her seat <laughs> smoked popcorn. it opens right. conversation and also brings more people word of mouth into the theater i prefer movies that have less of the jump scares because jump scares don't usually work on me a lot i was a character for hhn here at uh, universal studios so like mm. now knowing how it works it's kind of like yeah, you can see it coming though the conjuring too there's three scares that got me and I was so upset. I was like, wow. no, no. But um, I prefer the ones that stay with you and creep you and gets you inside your head and then you're like sleeping and then you hear that one little sound, something in the kitchen and you're like, well, I'm just gonna sleep with the light on tonight and tomorrow maybe. Like yesterday I was home with, uh, after The Conjuring and I took Falcor on the bed and I was like, <laughs> sense anything dogs are supposed to sense stuff it's just nothing it's like put me down I'm like all right yeah i have that with paranormal activity the first time i saw it i went home after all my friends had dropped me off and i closed every closet door and put things in front of it just in case you know because it does just in case it opens yes just in case it opens <sighs> it drags me you just never know when you're watching that that movie puts those thoughts in your head yeah. exorcism type like possession movies oh, yeah. really makes me uncomfortable yeah 
All right, what's next? Carrie Vanderberg writes, Hey, Collider Movie Crew. I'm a recent listener slash viewer. Mostly listen to the podcast, but watch the videos when I can. Films like LA Confidential and The Usual Suspect are two of my favorite films of all time. I feel like I've been waiting a long time to get the next great crime drama or murder mystery film to fit alongside those two. When do you think we'll get a new film in that genre? What is your favorite crime drama slash murder mystery film? Well, LA Confidential is actually one of my favorite mm. uh actually favorite movies of all time i mentioned goodfellas before that's a crime drama murder mysteries like crime dramas that's a genre that will never die mm -hmm. you know we talk about the ebbs and flows of the westerns and we're talking about superhero movies now and superhero fatigue crime drama is one of those things that will never die people will always watch them yeah um murder mysteries on the other hand not quite as popular as they used to be i was a big agatha christie fan used to read her books I would watch all the movies that were based on her books. Uh, Death on the Nile is probably my favorite one. Oh, yeah. Uh, Clue is a movie that I love. It's a comedy slash murder mystery. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely love that film. I watch it all the time. And But murder mysteries are just not that popular. So mm. when it comes to crime drama, you'll see a lot more of those. I don't think they'll ever be like these big tentpole blockbusters where right. they're going to make hundreds of millions of dollars. But I think... It, it's something that people will still want to see. Murder mysteries, on the hand, it's tough. You got to get people invested in them. Um, more recent films, Gone Girl was yeah. one. Oh, yeah. uh, Prisoners was a great one. Mm -hmm. uh, I, even Nice Guys, I would consider a, a kind of a gr crime drama comedy. Sure. Uh, Memento, comedy. Yeah. Reservoir Dogs. Uh, there's a French film called A Prophet. That yes. It's, oh, it's amazing. It's one of one of my favorite uh, crime dramas mm -hmm. uh, about basically the right it's almost like godfather in a prison yeah uh this, seeing that one guy just rise from from nothing uh and then obviously the departed what, what do you what do you think well yeah i agree i think you're definitely right dennis they're, they're, they're never going to be tentpole films and they make a big deal when they do make money like gone girl did everyone was very surprised at how much legs how many how much legs that, that film had you know to make as much as it did um because those, those are really rare and so yeah they're done that way and most of them are underappreciated most of them aren't uh, don't have high patronage, you know, and but the ones that people that do see them and seek them out love them, and so it's understandable why uh, why uh, Carrie was asking these questions because she probably wants he or she probably wants more, you know. Um, for me, Zodiac is my number one. I mean, Zodiac is so eminently rewatchable. It's a three-hour movie, and I will re I will rewatch it all the time, and I even rewatch the special features all the time, which are almost two hours in length each one exploring the case and exploring the thing is because there's so much involved seven is great uh the original old boy i think is mm -hmm. so fantastic and last year with sicario i thought sicario was because you didn't know which side of the fence anybody was on throughout that whole film and what's the murder who are they trying to figure out all that jazz uh, i think people should keep their eye out for blood father i don't want to say too much promoting of mel gibson because obviously there are things that he's done in his personal life that aren't necessarily positive but that that this film is getting a lot of buzz coming out of the festivals and it's directed by jean francois richet who did the mezzarine films with vincent cassell mm -hmm. who if you haven't seen these french films it's a it's a two-parter film and it is fantastic exploration of this guy as a uh, murderer and as a crime uh, crime lord and i think these these things are possible you just have to find the right people and the right actors to put them together there is a new uh crime drama slash murder mystery coming out though girl on the train okay That's oh coming out. right yeah i don't yeah. really know much about that other than i know that it's a book and so i didn't know there was that kind of aspect mm -hmm. to it. yeah i know mm -hmm. i didn't i thought it was going to be like some like romantic type novel and i read all, and then i well audible did and i was like oh it's different it was i really be like liked the, it yeah i thought it was gonna yeah. be like me before you or something <laughs> <laughs> not at on all. a train okay all right what's next <laughs> <laughs> on a train alex writes dear collider love the show and have been watching since the amc days i recently watched the classic film crocodile dundee and thoroughly enjoyed it i couldn't resist to ask what do you guys think about a crocodile dundee remake starring hugh jackman thanks and free on the filthy Okay, I love Crocodile Dundee. I love the, even the second one. Well, uh, Watch it when when I was get the third one on the hand. <laughs> yeah, let's not talk about that one. Right? No, I don't see it. I mean, Hugh Jackman would have to be pretty down on his luck. Like he'd have to have like several, four or five flops in a row before he <laughs> agreed to a Crocodile Dundee <laughs> remake or reboot. Look, while I love the the movie, it's it's an such an eighties movie. It's mm -hmm. one of those things, like a uh, Michael Keaton in Gung Ho, right? Yeah, I like that movie, but that movie has a bunch of stereotypes in it. Yeah, and that's what Crocodile Dundee is. It's, it has a bunch of stereotypes about Australia. Like, 
Like no no one from Australia watches that movie and goes, oh, that's an accurate depiction of uh, of our lifestyle. And so, I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, but yeah, so that's why I don't think we <laughs> will see one, and definitely not one with Hugh Jackman. <laughs> well, and not just Australian stereotypes. And there's that scene where he asks, and this is how innocent I guess we were in the '80s, where he asks his uh, uh, his uh, limo driver what tribe he's from. Yeah. He has an African reference, and then uses the, as a, uh, a boomerang this the the detail that he has on the back of his limo or whatever. And so there's that kind of stuff, but it's done for uh, more innocent laughs. Uh, I think it's certainly possible I think like you I think he would have to go through a few flops but Hugh's weird like this Hugh will take these off color films and be in them. like Real Steel what business is he doing in that film I actually like that movie but I'm saying it's it's not a typical Hugh Jackman no. thing but he stepped in so he, he will do these things that are kind of Kate Leopold as well he, he does these things that are kind of out of the mainstream a little bit and trying to explore his talent and I think he's really well used uh, uh, in comedies when he gets the opportunity and I think eh, it's certainly possible it would have to be a grittier a totally different kind of Crocodile Dundee but I, it, it would be a miracle if they made this happen Wendy have you ever seen Crocodile Dundee? Once and that's enough. <laughs> oh, oh man, oh, man. This is on a this is on our childhood. <laughs> I mean, it's such an eighties type. It movie, really is, right? Yeah. Like like a Rocky Four, or you know, like I mentioned, Gung Ho, Goonies, yeah. that that type of stuff. All right, what's next? <laughs> um, all right, Cody writes, "Dear Collider, Cody. I love I know I love going to the movies to immerse myself in other worlds to escape reality for ninety to one hundred and twenty minutes a day." But it seems like films are getting more and more based on reality with creative worlds dying out. With not much interest with not much interest being gained towards the Warcraft movie, I was wondering why people are so scared of fantasy. Every time I talk to fantasy every time I talk fantasy with someone, they say I can't get into a story unless it's set in reality. Have you encountered this logic before? And what are your take on the fantasy hurdle films have to get over? Well, I wouldn't say movies are getting more based on reality. I mean, look at the big superhero craze. <laughs> look at Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Look at Hunger Games. Look at all these movies. Those aren't set in reality, mm -hmm. and they're definitely. Not. I think what he, I think uh, what he was trying to say is more, just specific to fantasy, because I do notice there tends to be more people who are, are, are adverse to that. Lord of the Rings definitely helped with that. Game mm -hmm. of Thrones definitely helps out with that. But before those two. Fantasy was considered a genre that a lot of people wouldn't watch. I have encountered people like that before. I, I dated a girl who would, didn't didn't care for any sci-fi movies, superhero movies, or anything of, of of genre. She only wanted to watch like movies that were like either dramas mm. or even comedies that were set in reality. I had to I, I convinced her to watch Firefly. Oh, but yeah. the only way I could convince her is if I watched Sex in the City. So, <laughs> Nice trade. Yes, yes. Roka, have you encountered any villain like that? I'm assuming the relationship did not last. I'm assuming too no. many differences of it. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think fantasy is a, is a niche genre, a niche genre for that specific reason. You have to find it. You have to hunt it out, find the good ones, do the work, do the effort, and enjoy them. And that's why it has such a fervent fan base because the people love it so much, they protect it. So they don't want it to be uh, exposed in a negative way. And so I think that's that's the thing that's great about it. And you're right, you can lose yourself in this and enjoy it so much and kind of go into another world and yeah, escape your world. I work at the Harry Potter land. People walk into that and yeah, it's kind of tenuous fantasy, but people walk into it and cry. And yeah, and lose their minds and and like really love it and don't want to leave because it's a world that's safe and enjoyable and they understand how the rules work and that's I think that's really important with this genre and I think that it's always going to be a smaller genre and you have to bring people to it but most of the time people hunt it out and I think that's that's really the characteristic and why it's not as widespread and the studios don't necessarily invest a, a bunch of money very into costly it. Yes. fantasy is a very costly genre yeah just the costumes alone mm -hmm. right yeah. going into yeah. I, I haven't been to Harry Potter Land yet, but I'm, I'm waiting for the Game of Thrones Land to open. You know, <laughs> yeah, right. where you see, where you see beheading, <laughs> beheadings, brothels, <laughs> people being you know, pushed, yeah, out of things. murder, <laughs> betrayal, all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, wait, Wendy, do you have any friends or family that just aren't into kind of fantasy or maybe like? things that just aren't based in reality not so much fantasy because like my family growing up they actually love the fantasy type mm -hmm. genre films um i think my mother saw it as like fake history and so she's like oh it's okay for my daughter to like see this it's still educational mm -hmm. but f more like the comic book movies mm -hmm. there's actually a lot of my friends who are outside of you know this little like movie talk bubble that 
that are like, oh, I'm not really into those superhero type movies, and they don't get it, they don't read the comics, or they don't want to invest in it, so they want to spend their money on comedy mm. or like romantic, mm. like Me Before You and things like that. So it's like I want to have a discussion with them. I'm like, come and see. I'll pay for your ticket. Wow. Actually, that's how I got into Lord of the Rings. Is the first one came out and I hadn't seen it, and my friend said, please, please, please come see it with me. I will pay for your ticket. I'm like, I'm gonna be bored out of my mind with this movie because like the book was like you know this big, and then I watched it and then I became the biggest fan ever. And mm. I'm like, I'm missing out. And then I just dived into the fantasy stuff yeah. afterwards. Well, that's that's what you have to be brought to it. You know, that's the thing. And and for whatever reason, your friend knew you well enough to know that you would. Mm -hmm. You know, and those are the kinds of uh, to answer the question about friends and stuff. I, me, I've really constructed my life now to be surrounded by people who enjoy it. And like we'll go we'll go 30, 25 to thirty deep to go see an opening of any fantasy sci-fi superhero movie because wow. because it's us and we found each other and it's like we'll go watch it and enjoy it and talk about it afterwards at the bar and have drinks and joke about it and all the kind of jazz. So you you enjoy the communal experience knowing that you're not the only traveler on that road and mm -hmm. it's it's so great to have that. And so if you meet someone that is not into it, do you ostracize them? Well, just ban them from the <laughs> no, you can't even. be friends with us. You can't sit with us. You don't us. like the same stuff that we do. <laughs> it's more like listen, we're gonna do this. You can come with us or not, but we're gonna do this. It's more like that. Yeah. That and, and then I you know sometimes we you know we we have one friend that's not really inter entertainment i mean he'll go watch movies with us and watch tv shows with us but our rule is like shh <laughs> don't talk oh. don't talk because <laughs> what you got to say like just you know what i mean just comes from such an uninformed place yeah. like you you know cuz then it just ends up why is this guy like this and why is he where you know like it just becomes this, these things that like yeah you don't want to talk about so. <laughs> All right, what's the last question? Last one comes from Robert Johnson, who writes, Are critics too harsh on movies? A favorable score is 3 out of 5 or 60% just passing a D. How bad does a movie have to be to at least not get a D? I can't name more than a dozen films that I wouldn't at least give a D, or am I reading the system wrong? Uh, I think you may be reading the system wrong, because a 3 out of 5 that actually isn't too bad mm -hmm. when it comes to a movie score. I, I equate a 3 out of 5 closer to C. Mm -hmm. Maybe even a C plus. Yeah. Uh, I know it doesn't translate. You go, you know, you double that. It's six out of ten. It looks like a D. But I think when it comes to movies, I think five or six is kind of the midway point. Uh, do I think critics are too harsh? I don't think so. I think people forget is critics have to watch a lot of movies mm -hmm. over and over and over. And so when they start seeing the same thing over and over, they kind of get tired of it and they want to see something new that they haven't seen before. So mm -hmm. maybe in that regard, they'll be a little more critical. But other than that, I, I don't find it to be, you know, overly so. Yeah, when I was growing up, it was always about uh, finding out who are the most respected film critics and reading their reviews. They taught me how to, I didn't get to go to film school when I was growing up as a kid. Like, we don't have those classes in high school or anything else. Like, so for me, I knew I loved film at a very young age, so I would read Roger Ebert or Richard Roper or Gene Siskel or, or uh, you know, A.O. Scott or all these guys growing up through the through the years and, and Washington Post, New York Times. Whatever I could get my handle on, I would read because they analyzed movies so well. Because back then, you were taught in school school how to analyze a movie how to talk about its construction how to talk about the cinematography how to, so they they imbue you with a love of film now there's a division that's happening recently where people are starting to create fans versus critics stuff and it's like you're you're just because they're a critic doesn't mean their view is somehow better than yours i've been a big cause a big trumpeter for this go and enjoy go and learn how to analyze a film through the critics but then go on your own and decide what you like and what you don't like you don't have to listen to the critics it's your decision so are they too harsh not harsh i think that's all subjective sure it could be for a person who's a who doesn't like critics at all they're mm. too harsh but for me i think they're just offering their personal opinions it's my choice whether they take it or not and on the flip side of that you don't have to go crazy when the exactly. critic doesn't agree with you right. and, and like, they're out to get you know this movie they yeah. aren't they aren't out to get anything right. you know what i mean they're one they're not being paid off and two like because a lot of complaints well they don't like this type of movie really because civil war has a pretty high rotten tomato score you yeah. know what i mean a lot of critics enjoyed that film. So, and then it just get the rationale starts to go into the way, where, well, well, they like those ones, but then they don't like the one that I like. And like, there's, <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy talk. They, there is no, there's no secret meeting of the critics. Like, here, here, right. today, 
uh, next week when Batman v Superman comes out, we're all gonna not like this movie. All right, agreed. Okay, <laughs> ding, ding, ding. you know, like it's been so determined. So yeah, the stone and then that's cutters. How they get, there's like secret like email chains. None of that stuff happens. Yeah. You know, take off your tinfoil hat. That yeah. just that doesn't happen. Well, that's what I say. You take everything with a grain of salt and process it as you as you grow up. You're like, okay, well, I'm gonna listen to this and not listen to this. And I'm gonna go into this. I think the genesis of the question is probably like, do critics destroy films that I would like to see more of? And so I get upset. The critics have more power than I think they should have. And that's that's a legitimate uh, thing to have. But that's also the world we're walking into. You know, mm -hmm. people have a certain, and I think that's what sparked online criticism, sparked uh, networks like this. That people who are not necessarily have a PhD and masters in a film analysis can look at a film and talk truthfully about what they think, what their reaction is, what they saw, and that's there's there's a market for that. So I, I don't think you should give the critic so much power. It's your decision, your choice. And ultimately, studio, all they care about is the money. Yes. Look at Transformers franchise. Perfect Ooh, example. Man, all the critics, including myself, bash that thing to no end. Yeah. Has very low scores, makes a ton of money, and they're happy to make more and more. <laughs> so that's that's the ultimate decider. Is, is is people you know, paying with their, their money. Yeah. yeah. What is you guys' like rating system? Do you rate out of 10, out of five, A, B, C, D? I mean, I personally do grades. Here at Collider, mm. we do, you know, there's something that John started way back, even before Collider, before AMC Movie Talk, he always did out of a 10 point system. Mm -hmm. So that tradition has carried on here. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not gonna change that here. But personally, I like to grade on like A, B, C level. Cause I think it's a, because what he's talking about, this kind of number thing, kind of gets people's confused because they, they hear a number like, is it, you know, like, is six a good thing or a bad thing? Right. Or, you know, so yeah. personally, I do grades. What about you? I've always stayed in the five star system. Okay. That, and you can, can, you can go half star, and you can go mm -hmm. quarter star if you really want to be adventurous. But me, it's always been the five star. Quarter star. <laughs> yeah, quarter star. Yeah, some people get like real oh, deep and anal about it. So, but for me, it's always like, because like three and a half stars, four and a half stars, yeah. five and a half. That, that to me works. And that still works. I see it on UVerse all the time when I'm looking at movies. They do the three star system, five star mm -hmm. system, four star system. So you into it yeah, yeah the, the reason why i don't do a five star system is because of that confusion between the four and the five because yeah. a lot of people use the just the four star system yeah you know like four out of four stars you know oh, and, right you know instead and then some people do the five stars so mm -hmm. that's why i never Aww. used that one because it was gotcha. too confusing because if i said a four stars and a five star system that's pretty good in a four mm -hmm. star system that's excellent yeah so all right uh guys that's it for this episode of collider mailbag i want to thank the people joining me at the table today wendy where can people find you you can find me monday through friday in the chat rooms and you on movie talk and you can also find me at wendy lee zaney on uh, snapchat instagram and twitter roca where can people find you hey guys you can always find me at the roca says that's my homage to the rock on twitter and on instagram see the shows i'm hosting and the shows i get to be a guest on like uh, like today with on collider mailbag and also i host uh the walking dead oh no i'm sorry the game of thrones <laughs> recap show walking dead's over yes well, it's over. the game of thrones recap show with which dennis is is kind of come on uh and we do that every sunday night uh, until the end of the season yeah and you guys can find me on Twitter at Think Hero or Instagram Dennis.TZNG. You'll find me on Movie Talk Mondays and Fridays. Some spoiler reviews, some trailer reactions. We got a lot of stuff going on here at Collider. Don't forget to subscribe. YouTube.com slash Collider Videos. I want to thank Cody and Adam in the back over there. And we will see you guys tomorrow. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.